Um, first of all, uh, welcome everybody. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Paul, Paul Brandt, um, head chambers in Oriel Chambers, and Heather Belbin, who you can hopefully see on your screen at the moment in the spotlight function, uh, is one of our members of chambers, particularly has a, a large um, a degree of experience in the um, uh, person injury cases which have involved holiday sickness claims. Uh, and uh, our intention really today is to give hopefully a fairly short bite size um, uh, webinar, interactive if needs be, um, about the uh, Griffiths and TUI case, which I know has caused ripples of uh, interest throughout the profession generally, and inevitably lots and lots of questions. Um, so what I'm intending to do along with Heather is I'll give a very brief introduction, uh, then Heather is going to uh, give us an overview of the case, um, and particularly some of the issues raised by the case um, in relation to the field, that spe specialist field of litigation. Uh, I will then give a, um, a personal view as to some of the broader issues raised in terms of litigation generally, and um, then we'll have questions or conclusions. Now, as barristers, I'm going to promise that we're hoping to have most of this done within 25 minutes, but anyone who's been to court with barristers will know the one thing you never trust is a barrister's time estimate. So um, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll do our best to be on the message. Well, I would say to Bramps, anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. what I would say to you uh, is that we are recording this. Um, uh, so if it's that's many to for those of you who've only just joined a moment ago, that's in order to ensure that we can um, make it online as a resource, which other people in DWF who haven't been physically able to attend uh, may well be able to access it. We'll upload it onto our teams and send out a link through Sarah. Uh, if you found this, a, well, let us know at the end if you found this a useful way of having um, a bite sized chunk of training, and we'd be more than happy to provide more um, if you'd find that useful. So, um, without further ado, unless anyone's got any questions, um, at this stage, um, I'll hand over to Heather. Hello. Hi, everybody. I can see some of you, not all of you. I hope you can all see and hear me. Um, right, Griffiths and TUI. It is worth reading the whole Supreme Court judgment. It's not a very long one. I think it's about 30 pages. But paragraph 60 onwards is the most important part. There's also on the Supreme Court website a much shorter document, which is called the Press Summary. And that sets out the main points uh, that we all need in, in dealing with litigation. So, in fact, it's a useful noddy's guide uh, and something you may want to, to have with you handy um, when you're dealing with cases. Briefly, the claimant in this case suffered a nasty tummy upset on holiday in Turkey in 2014 and he sued his holiday company. The case has meandered through various appeals and eventually to the Supreme Court. In that case, the defendants obtained their own medical reports and had witnesses but chose not to rely on them. Uh, I suspect that was because of the cost involved, having been involved in, in those sorts of cases myself for the defendants. Um, part 35 were put to the claimant's experts on some but not all the defendant issues, um, and the defendant chose not to call the claimant's expert for cross-examination. The defendant then produced a skeleton argument at the last minute, effectively, I think the afternoon before the trial, and then relied in closing on issues that he hadn't raised before. Now, the Supreme Court found this to be unfair, as if the experts had been challenged by Code of Part 35s or by cross-examination, he may have provided further or better reasoning. The court did accept that the expert report wasn't great and was quite a weak report, but was essentially uncontroverted. With any, evidence, with any evidence from the defendants. So therefore the trial judge uh, um, found it, it, for the trial judge to reject it, it was unfair in all those circumstances. Clearly this just put defendants in a difficult position, particularly with low value cases uh, in relation to cost and proportionality. It doesn't just relate to holiday sickness cases, of course, it goes throughout the whole gamut of, of, of personal injury cases. And, of course, includes all witnesses, not just experts. Basically, if the defendant or claimant wishes to challenge a witness or an expert, they should do so by way of cross-examination if possible. Griffiths does suggest that the same effect may be achieved by tactical part 35s or, or maybe part 18s in some circumstances, if it's a lay witness. 
Um, I suspect this is going to lead to some problems in some cases. The Part 35s are not robust and comprehensive. However, I don't think it's an absolute gift to claimants, or, although there are a lot of claimant firms who are taking that view at the moment. Um, and looking at the uh, full case, um, uh, uh, looking at the full case, I'm going to look at a few of the paragraphs that I think are important. Paragraph 60 makes it clear that there must be fairness overall. Paragraph 61 to 68 give a list of possible exceptions, which I'll come to in a, in a little while. Paragraph 69 uh, makes it clear the judge is not to be put into a straitjacket. There must be a degree of flexibility. In other words, it's not a case of if it's in the medical report and unchallenged, the court must accept it, um, which I'm afraid at the moment is a stance that claimant solicitors are taking, particularly in low value cases. Everything must be weighed up, of course. And what it does basically is, it is illustrate the tension between whether a claimant proves their case on the balance of probabilities with very weak expert evidence and the potential unfairness of the defendant seeking to challenge that evidence in closing submissions for the first times, for the first time. Paragraph 70 um, uh, gives a helpful summary uh, of the findings of the Supreme Court. Looking at the exceptions themselves, they start at paragraph 61. Um, three and five are probably the most useful, but I'll run through them all. One and two are where there is an issue um, in the expert report which is insignificant or collateral, or where the evidence is incredible or essentially nonsense. But that's relatively straightforward. Number three is where there is no reasoning for the expert's opinion. So it's important to scrutinise the expert's report, as particularly in low value cases, the medical reports are often extremely basic. Um, so certainly in those sorts of cases, very often you, you can show that there's no reasoning and that the expert's just making a bold statement. Number four is where there's an obvious mistake or, 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 or there's something absurd in the report. Again, I, I think that's probably self-explanatory. Number five is the other important one. And this is where the witness's evidence is contrary to the basis on which the expert expressed their opinion. And this is particularly important, of course, where the claimant is inconsistent in oral evidence or their witness statement with the, that other evidence. Uh, this is going to occur, I suspect, a lot in portal claims, either stage threes or the new OIC um, portal, where the CNF or the SCNF, uh, for those who don't do those kind of cases, that that's the initial document that's, that's filled in in relation to the case. And it's where those documents are inconsistent with the claimant's evidence and the medical report. That already comes up an awful lot in, in, in those sorts of cases. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, since Griffiths, the, the court, some courts, and um, particularly um, some of our more local courts, are, are taking view that if it's in the medical report, it's gospel. And that's it. Well, I, I, I don't think that's quite the way it should be dealt with. Um, and certainly in terms of the exceptions that are set out, I do think that three and five, that, that the good arguments can be put in relation to those. Six and seven are where the expert fails to answer part 35 satisfactorily or fails to comply with part 35 requirements. I mean, that, that's nothing new, really. Um, those issues have always been at the forefront uh, of expert uh, evidence. In terms of practical implications, uh, in high value cases, it's probably going to have little effect because in those cases, the defendants generally want and are given permission to obtain their own medical evidence. And they do tend to, to put far more comprehensive and detailed part 35s because uh, it's proportionate to those cases. And um, in terms of costs, it's, it's worth them doing. Where it's going to have more of an effect, in my view, is in low value cases. So fast track, OIC portal process, the stage three portal process and um, intermediate cases uh, when they start to come in, which I think um, is going to be cases issued after October. It's have a particular impact on those cases as the medical reports tend to be more basic and can often lack any reasoning and be inconsistent with other documents uh, and I, I do believe that exceptions three and five uh, set out in, in the judgment uh, of Griffiths uh, are the ones to use in that regard. 
as I've indicated, some courts are, are, are taking it to be gospel that if it's in the medical report, no matter whether there's any reasoning or not, um, uh, that that means that uh, they can rely on it. Uh, so I do think defendants need to be more proactive in making those arguments um, at court. In terms of holiday sickness claims generally in the context of this case, and of course it is a holiday sickness case, I don't know how much any of you have been involved in those sorts of cases, but um, there was a multitude of them some years ago, uh, and they probably died out shortly pre-pandemic <coughs> and then haven't um, reared their heads again because, of course, people weren't going on holiday. Um, having been involved in many, many such cases for the defendants, it was common practice not to rely on, on for the defendant not to rely on their own medical reports um, or their own witnesses. Uh, and just to challenge the claimant's evidence in, in closing, that became very, very common. Uh, the court were deluged with these cases, and I suspect would find for the defendants in those circumstances because they were fed up with so many cases coming before the court. Um, and and I, I suspect in those cases, a lot of the courts started to forget what the basic premises are, that you have to, it's an adversarial system, and you have to challenge at the other side's evidence, and um, if you want to, to rely on that challenge. The case of Wood and TUI, which, which was an important case in um, holiday sickness cases, also dealt with uh, in uh, this, in the Griffiths judgment. I think it's paragraph 79. The trouble is, what was set out in Wood and TUI, which was effectively uh, uh, the, the courts uh, in Wood and TUI said it, you, you should be wary of uh, allowing a case where there was only one claimant who'd suffered sickness uh, and that, that, that you should look to see whether there are similar cases um, to support that person. Well, Griffiths, I'm afraid, has watered down that effect and that basically says that, that, that you, you don't really, you don't really need to do that. I suspect that this will bring a resurgence of holiday sickness case following this decision. And if that happens, of course, the defendants dealing with such cases may have to take a very different approach. The key point really from Griffiths is it's not safe for a party to simply sit back and only challenge experts for the first time at trial um, or in their closing speech. I think that covers everything that I wanted to do. And unless there's anything specific anyone wants to ask me at this point. Unless there's any burning questions, maybe we can leave the, uh, uh, leave the questions to the end. Heather, if you're able yeah. to mute yourself, just for a moment, so we don't get oh, off yeah. feedback. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I think the first point to say in relation to the wider course of litigation is that there is a real tension between the approach that the part the defendants are expected to adopt, expressed in Griffiths, and the court's um, uh, requirement under Part 35 to restrict expert evidence to that that's reasonably necessary. Um, if the defendant is compelled, as almost certainly in most cases it will be now, to ensure that there is sufficient challenge in one way or another to the experts' reports, in any uh, in anything other than a multi-track case, you will nearly always have a very uphill struggle in getting your own expert evidence. And so we, uh, it needs to be, um, uh, sufficient directions need to be given to ensure that the defendant has the opportunity to ask questions. And more importantly, those questions need to be highly tailored to ensure that when it comes to closing submissions, that there is nothing that is presented to the court in terms of closing submissions that the expert hasn't had a chance to respond to, or the claimants more generally at least, are not ambushed or taken by surprise in relation to that submission. It makes running the case much harder because traditionally um, uh, that evaluation as to the uh, amalgamation of the, of the defendant's best case that we presented in closing submissions is something um, uh, which is conducted at trial. Um, there will therefore need to be a greater evaluation when looking at particular claims in which the defendant doesn't have its own expert at an early stage um, about the, the attack lines that are going to be deployed in relation to 
the expert evidence. In many cases, soft tissue injuries where there's no or, um, uh, objective evidence of the injury, uh, the approach is relatively straightforward if it's a put into proof case, because in those circumstances, one of the questions that is habitually asked of the expert uh, and the part 35 questions is, uh, if the, is your report based on the accuracy of what you've been told by the claimant? And in those type of soft injury cases, they nearly always say, yes, it is. Uh, and um, now it may be wise to put in an additional question, which says if the uh, if the claimant's account about the progression of symptoms is not accurate, uh, does that undermine or also the basis of your uh, report? Nearly always they would have to say yes. Um, so in terms of the mere putting to proof cases, I suspect it won't involve a huge change in the approach that's normal that's currently adopted, except to say that in almost every case, you will need to be asking part 35 questions uh, because in absence of expressly challenging that expert um, through questioning, you may be prevented from even raising the issue at trial. Uh, so for those type of cases, I suspect there is less change to the way that you, um, that defendants have been approaching these cases. Um, the more the area of litigation where I suspect there will be much greater change in the approach to them is a case like Griffiths, where there are multiple uh, potential causes of an index injury, uh, potential issues about the chronological uh, um, progression of uh, insults or causes of action. If there are more than one in Griffiths, there were potentially two infections of different types of um, uh, uh, tummy bugs. Um, which could have been ingested or the could have been occur could have been um, uh, as a result of either pre holiday events or the holiday itself an all inclusive um, venue or alternatively a meal that was taken off site uh, in Griffith the court, the Supreme Court said that the report itself was sufficient to demonstrate that there had been consideration of all of uh, ex alternative causes, but the medical legal expert had decided that applying his expertise, that the that the explanation that he had provided was the most uh, likely on the balance of probabilities, and therefore his evidence as to causation uh, was effectively a matter that the court couldn't overturn. If there is a case where there are complicated features. If there is, for example, an objective evidence of some injury and it is a necessary part of the defense to identify either that that was uh, caused earlier or later than the index um, incident that's the basis of the claim, or if it is suggested uh, that there is um, a pre existing history or some other reason why the index action didn't cause the injury complained of, it will be essential to ensure that that argument is at least understood and presented to the expert who can then um, has the opportunity of responding to it. As Heather indicated earlier on, the interestingly, the touchstone for this judgment is not that there was a strict rule of evidence or that there was a technical rule that was trans, uh, transgressed. But the, the Supreme Court said that the reason why um, the approach adopted by the defendants in Griffiths was unsupportable was because it did not give the claimant a fair trial. And it didn't give the, the claimant a fair trial because the defendants were effectively ambushing the claimant with sets of arguments that their expert had not had the opportunity of responding to in uh, either in cross-examination as a live witness or by way of Part 35 uh, responses. Um, so it does mean, well, I think there's two issues that arise from that. The first is it's interesting to see the Supreme Court in this case and indeed in other cases, for example, the Rwanda case, introducing into uh, English common law principles that are really taken uh, directly from the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. And there's some uh, jurisprudential commentators who 
who think that the Supreme Court is um, trying to bolster some of those rights that are given under the Convention in English law, just in case the Convention is to be, uh, the UK was to withdraw from it. That's perhaps a tendency to look at uh, in future cases. But in relation to claims where um, the defendants wish to contest issues of uh, causation uh, or indeed uh, the actual injury sustained, it is essential that the defendant's expert is challenged. That means in almost every case you will need to have a set of Part 35 questions, and that may mean that you will need at an early stage in a more complicated case to have a conversation with uh, the counsel or whoever's like to be presenting the trial to ensure that the various lines of argument that are like to be presented are properly ventilated in Part 35 questions. Um, what is interesting in the um, in the uh, in the Supreme Court's, Supreme Court's view is that uh, the mere fact that the expert may reject an assertion that is put to him in cross-examination or in Part 35 questions does not automatically mean uh, that the court is prevented from uh, rejecting that expert's evidence. But what it cannot do is it can't, can't re uh, dismiss or reject that evidence if the expert hasn't been given the opportunity of responding to the allegations or arguments that will be placed at the closing submissions. So even if you get uh, responses to your Part 35 questions, which come back negative from the relevant expert, and we all know that some of the experts act uh, on occasions in a way more akin to a hired gun, and take quite an adversarial approach on these things. But even if you get that, it doesn't mean that you, uh, as a defendant, are prevented from raising issues of causation or the substance of the argument that the uh, Part 35 questions is challenging. But it just means, um, uh, but it does mean, obviously, that um, uh, you have given the other side the opportunity to respond to those uh, um, uh, challenges. And that then, of course, will then lead you to consider whether or not you want to go back to court and ask for the defendant to get their own expert evidence if the challenges come back in a way that you regard as unsupportable. Um, so, in summary, every case needs to be considered intensely at the Part 35 question stage. A view as to the likely arguments to be presented at trial fully understood and raised early by way of challenge. That probably means that you want to ensure that any directions and sequencing is such that you get your opportunity to raise part 35 questions after the exchange of witness statements, certainly after disclosure. And you will need to ensure that in the case plan that there is active consideration as to how the defendants want to respond to any part 35 the plot replies that come back that are um, unduly partisan, are irrational, or um, are, in our view, unsupportable. We've had a whistle stop tour there of the issues that are raised in the in the case. Um, we can open it up now to any questions people have got. Hopefully, people can unmute themselves. If they can't unmute themselves, if they raise their hands. Paul, if I can ask one oh. thing, I had that. Um, thank you. That yeah. was very informative. When uh, the, you, you can imagine with my case later, who I'm going to ask about, Paul, because the majority of cases you get from me are from one firm. When a claimant solicitor says that their report, which is endorsed with a part 35 statement of truth, is not an expert report, but a factual report. How do you suggest we challenge that? Because we can't ask part 35 questions because I refuse to. And an interim application for return of part 35 is without provision for it in a directions order and not being asked within 28 days of receipt is likely to fail. Just be yeah. interested to hear your thoughts on that. So those are, if I'm uh, guessing right here, we're talking about reports that are engineering, purport to be engineering expert reports, often endorsed with a statement of truth by an individual who will uh, say that they have inspected the relevant motor vehicle. Um, and that is used as the, as the launch pad for the argument that the vehicle involved in the index accident is unroadworthy, which then triggers a higher, uh, higher credit higher challenge. So 
Uh, and the, um, the, in, the approach to that by certain high profile firms has changed over the years, not least as a result of a case that I was involved in where the engineer yes, was completely disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> well, as often in these cases, it often is. Um, so the start, uh, uh, my view is as follows, that those reports contain an amalgamation of pure factual evidence, which the, um, the other side are entitled to rely upon. For example, um, a photograph taken by the engineer inspecting the vehicle disclosed as part of that report is under the rules, as long as it's been properly uh, disclosed in accordance with the directions, a document. A document is assumed to be a genuine, doc a disclosed document is presumed under the rules to be a genuine copy of the relevant index document disclosed. So if it is to be challenged that those are in fact photographs taken on the date or of the at the location or of the relevant vehicle, then you will need to consider serving the notice to challenge uh, the individual, um, uh, the veracity of the individual document. But insofar as those reports contain photographs, in my view, they are pure documentary evidence. Insofar as they contain observations that are not directly relevant to the index photographs that you have seen. So if, for example, um, a, an observation about the time of the inspection, the location of the inspection, which was relevant to um, some of those cases, my view is that that is factual evidence, but the defendant, sorry, the claimants will need to produce lay witness evidence if they want to rely upon that information. However, the key issue that they normally want to rely upon is a combination of the um, reported damage, which I think insofar as it is shown in the photographs is a matter of fact. Uh, the repair costs, which um, I've had different judges take different views on that. Some say, well, look, I'm regularly presented in these cases with repair invoices and even repair estimates, and they just give a list of the price of replacement items. Um, in the main, most judges will take that as factual evidence. Uh, and then the third cluster of items that are contained in those documents are opinion evidence, and those are valuation of the index vehicle, and uh, that normally then leads to the decision as to whether it's repairable or should be treated as a write-off. Um, so a slightly lesser extent salvage value, but most importantly, the decision as to whether or not the vehicle is roadworthy. Those, in my view, are all opinion evidence. And um, I have uh, previously seen solicitors write to um, certain claimant firms when the claimant's firm has not sought to rely upon that document as expert evidence saying we will, you know, uh, we, we dispute that this vehicle was unroadworthy and just put you on notice that that's an issue that we'll be raising at trial. And then it's for them to decide how they wish to proceed. Um, if it's quite clear from the evidence of the damage to the vehicle that it is not roadworthy, let's say that you know, the front wheel is completely buckled on the motorcycle, then I don't think a judge is going to need expert evidence to decide that point. But if it is, as is often these cases, it's been involved in a knock and we're, we fear that the front forks may or may not have incurred some kind of latent damage. So accordingly, we're going to rack up £50,000 worth of credit hire cases, uh, charges. I think they require, um, the court will want expert evidence to satisfy itself that the vehicle concerned was um, unroadworthy. So it's a bit of a difficult, I'm, I'm sorry it's a long-winded answer, but it falls into three different categories. But the one that they need to rely upon is the key one, which in my view is expert evidence. And um, if they choose to proceed without that expert evidence, it's very much a high wire act. And specifically, if you've got a letter on file, telling them that we're putting that issue at roadworthiness in issue, then no trial judge, in my view, is going to suggest that we've taken them by ambush when we make those closing submissions. So applying to that to, to Griffiths and to, we basically say, we would say to clients, when you get these in early doors, send part of the 35 questions anyway, but put on notice saying we consider this X, but we don't agree. Follow it up with a pleading in the defence and an account schedule, and then they can't say, you know, you've ambushed us again, as per you normally do and then see what the judge says from that. I, I would 
I would dot that course here. Super. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Sarah. Yeah, hi Paul. I just wondered if you had have you dealt with many applications since this case, um, this judgment in terms of people who haven't put the Par thirty five questions obviously before this judgment came out and, and if so, what's your success? How are the how are the courts approaching it essentially? Being sympathetic, or so that's that's a good question. Um, uh, as always, there's a degree of judicial difference, and uh, Heather may have a very different experience. So I would say, in the uh, in the cases where there is no objective sign of injury, so it's a relatively modest soft tissue injury um, in the fast track or similar, um, most of the arguments will be contingent on the accuracy of the claimant's account, and there will be particularly if the DWF have been involved. It's normally a pretty good part 35 that covers it. On the on the bigger multi-track cases where I've got actual experts on both sides, it doesn't really come into play at all. Um, I think the bigger problem will be in the slightly complicated cases, when, in other words, where there is some obvious index injury which has been sustained. Um, I, I did one about a, a, a guy cut the end of his thumb off as a result of a, an accident when shearing sheep. No, telling shape actually. Um, they, um, and um, there, there was no doubt that he had been injured, but there was some issues about other aspects of his claim. Um, we, there, it, in that particular case, it was contingent on factual evidence about whether or not he, in fact, had the physical ability that he complained he has lost. Um, so it hasn't been hasn't been the key issue in the cases that I've dealt with so far. Heather may have a different um, experience. I'd be interested to know what you, you think, Heather. Oh, you're on mute. You need to unmute. You need to unmute. Heather? There we go. <laughs> Not very technical, people. Um, yeah, it's really only post-Christmas that Griffiths and TUI has started to show itself in the courts. I think it was the end of November that the judgment was given, um, but, but it, I didn't see it raised at all since Christmas. So you're only, you're only talking sort of probably three weeks or so. I've seen it raised in Birkenhead, and Birkenhead are one of the courts that appear to be taking the view that if it's in the medical report, it must be gospel. Um, that's in OIC cases or stage threes. I haven't seen it coming up in a fast track case yet. I suspect that it will come up more and more and more over the next few months um, while the courts adjust to it and decide how they're going to, to, to approach it. Um, and I suspect that it's going to make cases a little bit longer, probably, because there's, there's going to be some quite fierce arguments um, in, in between the parties in relation to Griffiths and TUI. Because um, the problem is, in, in, in a, as I've already said, in, in a lot of the very low value cases, in the portal cases, the medical reports are really very, very basic and don't give terribly much reasoning at all in, in terms of the mechanism of injury, um, the circumstances of the accident, uh, etc. Um, so that there must be an argument there in terms of, uh, of the exceptions, but I think it does remain to be seen how that is going to pan out. All I can tell you at the moment in, in Birkenhead, and I suspect also in St Helens, um, that they are taking it a little bit as, oh well, in the medical report, therefore it's to be accepted. And, and I, I, I don't think Griffiths and TUI says that, really. I think that there's a lot more to it. Um, so I think we are going to have to wait and see a little bit to see what happens um, in the future with future courts. And, and as Paul says, it is going to be you could the court you're in. We all know that certain courts have, have different views about, you know, some are considered to be more claimants, some are considered to be more defendants. So that's going to colour things as well, I think. I would I would expect that if you've got a case which this is going to be an issue in the sense that there are slightly complicated issues about causation or sequencing of events or what was caused by the index um, breach of duty, that 
it's worth considering seeking permission for additional part 35 questions out of time now rather than run the risk of being faced at trial by a claimant saying you're prevented from arguing that point so there will be cases that you know, everyone on this call has got in the back of their mind where they're thinking i don't know now whether or not i'm in i'm, I'm at risk on this point the most um so the safest way to proceed is to draft a set of additional part 35s now even if the time has expired setting out essentially what you anticipate will be the closing submission arguments that you want to invite the judge to accept and making an application now uh, or if you maybe you can you can obtain the claimant's consent to, to get to put additional questions to the expert and then the expert may well answer them in any event uh, but if the claimant doesn't then make an application and I would be astonished if the court uh, doesn't then end up taking the view of saying, well, we're going to allow those additional questions. And if the claimant objects, then be, uh, most judges would just say, well, OK, we uh, if you if you are objecting to these additional questions being asked, you can't then cry foul when these arguments are deployed in closing submission, um, because that effectively then closes the circle on the fairness argument. Because it gets back to that point that the underlying principle in Griffiths was the issue about fairness to the uh, to, to the claimant in that case. Does that, does that, that sounds just a question. It does. Uh, yeah. No, no, that's Great. really helpful. And then, as you say, it, it's uh, that, that takes away that argument, doesn't it? That you're basically showing your hand, aren't you? And I know there's obviously the arguments about ambush, but I think sometimes that's why tactically you don't put the part 35 questions because you don't want to give away all <laughs> all of your arguments. So it is. It, it's a difficult one, isn't it? So I and Heather. Used to, when we first started out in the good old days, you used to be able to turn up at court and disclose surveillance evidence on, on the morning of the trial. Sadly, the good old days of being able to yeah. ambush the other side disappeared, and so we have to cards on the table litigation, I'm afraid, yeah. since uh, everything's ventilated in advance. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions? Uh, what do you got at the moment? Please either raise your hand or just unmute and. Um, Shout. OK. If not, oh, no. if not, um, can I thank everybody for uh, coming along? We've overrun slightly. So, again, uh, my uh, earlier pre-apology was obviously well um, more shadowing time. It may well be that um, there are issues that you've got that come up in practice with. I mean, Patrick mentioned one earlier on about how to do with some of the uh, Approaches taken by some claim firms in Part 35 engineering reports. If there's issues that you would find it helpful for us to do sort of bite-sized seminars on, or even just do like a workshop or a, uh, a, a sort of a, a surgery on particular issues, disclosure or whatever it might be, have a word with Sarah or get in touch with with myself directly, and we can we can sort that out if people would find it useful. More than happy to have that ongoing dialogue. Well, thanks very much, Paul and Heather. That's been really helpful. Really, very much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I let everyone go and actually get some sandwiches and uh, <laughs> get some sustenance before two o'clock. All right. Many thanks. Thanks very much. Thank Cheers you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.